This is a, uh, a wonderful museum, as you can uh, see by the exterior that we just showed you. Uh, it's gorgeous on the exterior, and it's equally gorgeous on the interior. That there's nothing corny about this museum. It was laid out by an artist and is done extremely well, like the many of the things in Merida. It has a huge collection of both the large statues that would be in the public places and also the statues that I like better which are the smaller ones this is this is a public statue by the smaller ones I mean those that are modeled out of clay we're going to take you through a little trip here you can see that you know some of the statues have been you know, weathered which as you might expect was going to happen here in a climate that's 100% humidity and heavy rains and heat uh, during the summer, although as we all know, it's quite nice. Here's an example of the interiors. The interior of the museum is like the Frick Museum in New York. It's gorgeous. It's just the, that the Bella Park uh, style that all of the millionaires uh, seem to have adopted, and it was done extremely well in this uh, home, which has been converted into this extraordinary museum. Um, the thing that's striking about it is how well they've placed the various sculptures. Some are high and some are low, and this is the entranceway in the back here so that you get a glimpse of these guys from the other side as well as a uh, huge oval um, sculpture as you come in but but uh, just again I'm going to go up in the air every once in a while just to show you the 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 care and the, the craftsmanship in restoring this museum that in fact it was undoubtedly as beautiful as this when it was first built or else the guy wouldn't put his money down <laughs> but in terms of how it was restored and the color schemes and just simply gorgeous and the lighting is extraordinary it made making this particular film easy here's one of the clay statuettes that i'm talking about they seem to have a have had an aesthetic the mayans and i don't know which period these are from i didn't bother to take a look at that as an artist i was just interested in how refined it was and how comical it can be at times and also how ghostly you know uh, here's some more of the exterior faces that have been weathered by time that's true of everything everywhere in the world and I it, it, it's probably increasing too it's a very well preserved exterior sculpture uh, but here that that process will be it slowed down as long as this museum stands and of course the others there are some beautiful ones in Mexico City as well that have the Aztec remains but all of the carvings are all documented in Spanish and English so if you're a history buff and you want to know some more about what was really happening here this is the place you can go and you can find out uh, but just to take a just stroll through it is just aesthetically beautiful it's just uh, something that you can spend an afternoon there sometimes it's free to get in i guess in the evening i've been in here for free and i've been here when they charge you about you know three bucks or so to get in um but whether it's, whether it's the evening or it's uh in the daytime the, the the interior is always the same it's always lit the same it's really quite quite stunning one of the things that you know, struck me about the um Mayan clay sculpture. I didn't spend a lot of time on the pottery. I'm not a big pottery buff, but when I was a young man, I happened to be in 
Princeton, New Jersey at one time for a swim meet, and I stumbled into their collection of Incan statues like this one. These little, look at how that, that curve of the body, it's almost Greek, isn't it? It's not your frontal anymore. In most of their statues, like the Egyptians, are your frontal. There's just one way to look at them, basically, and that's from the front, but there are some are starting to get that bend in the body that you see in the Greek. But in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of the overlaying of the articles of clothing and the symbology, basically, that, that in fact identify each of these supposed nobles, I would presume, there are some times that the little statuettes that are recovered seem to be of ordinary people or maybe people of standing, but not the king necessarily. Uh, the thing that really strikes you are their faces, their really beautiful faces. These, of course, are your skulls, which wouldn't be a, be a, a collection without them. As we know, death played a part in the Mayan spiritual system, and, and it's, it still continues today in, in Mexico. His uh, Quetzalcoatl, again, all of his symbology is put into his garments. That's something that was done in Egypt too with the hat or the headpieces of the you know, pharaohs described as to what kingdom they were, whether they were the pharaohs of the lower uh, kingdom or the upper kingdom or both as it turned out after a while when Egypt was united. But these seem to be a little more complicated than that. And it's these are obviously made by different artists at different times, and yet there's a kind of uniformity to the way in which the art is approached. It's not always true, but it is pretty true. It's like when you see in Greek art, it basically is what it is, and, and you take a look at Egyptian art, it has a certain way of looking at things, and you can see right here that that's also true for the most part in terms of the Mayan sculpture is, is a very good example of all that symbology kind of woven into the figure. So get down to see this. It's on 45th and Paseo Monteo. It's one of the nicest museums I've ever been into.